I have the distinct pleasure of first introducing one of my colleagues, a guy that I've known for a long time, Ruben Martinez, is now a professor of English and the chair, the Fletcher Jones chair here at uh, LMU. Uh, before he was exiled out of Los Angeles for being too critical and sent to uh, Houston, New Mexico, or just roaming the desert. He previously had uh, I met him when he was uh, one of the commentators on uh, um, a program that still exists today on, on KCET, um, Life and Times. Uh, and uh, he was one, one of the th uh, three moderators for that. In addition, you know, he worked for the LA Weekly, has written several books, and we are uh, very happy here at LMU to have him uh, come back, uh, Ruben Martinez. We are also very honored today to have um, a Academy Award winner, Kathy Schulman, uh, producer of the movie Crash, which was the best picture in, uh, last year in uh, uh, 2005. So I guess you get to go back now, right? Yeah. Do you actually get to present an award? I have to give up my crown. Oh, you do? <laughs> well, uh, who, who do you think is going to win the award this year? Oh, I'm not, you, I'm not making predictions. <laughs> really? One out of five, you've got a 20% chance of being right. <laughs> Putting her in a tough spot. I can ask those questions since I have tenure. <laughs> and, and I'm not, that's the problem, they don't give us tenure. That's right. I'll get fired tomorrow. Uh, she is one of the uh, highest ranking uh, females in uh, the movie industry. And I've never really understood the movie industry, so it's, it was very difficult to figure out what, you know, every time you start watching the movie, it's like four or five film industry or, or companies come on. I have no idea who does what or, or how that occurs. But we are honored to have her here. She did a, a great job with, with that film, has done all kinds of different other things. And what we like to do is maybe show a clip uh, of, um, um, of a of an award that uh, you and the film received, and we can start with that, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ruben, who's going to ask some questions, uh, who actually referenced the movie in an article that he just published in the LA Times this past Sunday of a book review, and then we'll, after, right after that, have a couple of questions, and then we'll get uh, Lynn Goldfarb to come up here, and myself, and the four of us will continue the conversation. First, let's watch this clip, and then, Ruben, I'm going to turn it over to you. It has been said that life imitates art. The film Crash gives us a life lesson in the ways we treat others. Crash confronts the reality of race, class, and ethnicity in America, and it forces us to take an honest look at our individual prejudices, hopes, and our fears. In the real city, you walk, you know? You brush past people, people bump into you. In LA, nobody touches you. We're always behind this metal and glass. No more phone calls in the heart. As a matter of fact, here, you can hold the battery. Okay? Wait, 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 wait. You see what that woman just did? You see that? Why, she's cold. She got colder as soon as she saw us, though. You couldn't find a whiter, safer, or better lit part of this city right now. But yet this white woman sees two black guys who look like UCLA students strolling down the sidewalk, and her reaction is blind fear. Out of the what? car! Give me the key! I just had a gun pointed in my face. Face. You lower your voice. And it was my fault because I knew it was going to happen. But if a white person sees two black men walking towards her and she turns and walks in the other direction, she's a racist, right? Well, I got scared and I didn't say anything. And 10 seconds later, I had a gun in my face. Everyone has a, sh a, a thread of racism in there somewhere. If it takes my face and my voice to, to, to spew that anger out and to, to make people listen to it, I'm glad. This is one of those movies that nobody wants to admit whether or not they feel this way because it's something that's usually said behind doors, you know what I mean? So for people to see it up front and close like this, some people are gonna be upset, it's gonna be real controversial, but damn it, it's the truth. How about a geography lesson? My father's from Puerto Rico, my mother's from El Salvador. Neither one of those is Mexico. Uh, well then I guess the big mystery is who gathered all those remarkably different cultures together and taught them all how to park their cars on their lawns. This is what happens when people aren't being polite, and, and that's, I guess, what the challenge of this film is, is to say, you know you want to laugh at that, 
You know that's wrong to laugh at that, but you want to laugh at that. So go ahead and laugh at that, and then examine why did I, why was that funny to me, and why, and why was I struggling with is it okay to laugh, and is it okay to laugh? That to me is the best thing a film can do is really raise questions and make you examine your own motives. We just love to define people. We love to say good person, bad person, and, and we and we make that decision instantly. And usually it's by oh you know, the color of their skin, the what the kind of clothes they wear. I wanted to tell an ensemble piece uh, without any of the any of the uh, the characters knowing each other. Ready and action! Look, I am a television director. We wait a we we're just coming home from the television. Hands on cool. top of your head, ma'am. Will you just do what he says? Now, do you have any guns or knives or anything I might get stuck with? We're sorry, and we would appreciate if you would just let us go home when a warning. Do you have any idea how that felt? To have that pig's hands all over me? And you just stood there. And then you apologized to him? I mean, what did you want me to do? Get us both shot? Print that one. Very nice. What happens in those scenes and what it, it forces you to consider is, is very um, provocative and almost kind of dangerous. For me, it was very difficult to play a character who's this extreme, and I found it kind of disturbing to play. We all carrying on our own burden. We just gotta try and find some hope, some hope. Because unless you explore these issues, unless you just sit them out and go, no, this is the truth, guys. If we don't like it, it's not politically correct, it's not, but this is the truth. This is what we feel. And until you explore those issues, you can't deal with them. Daddy! Honey, stay the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights is proud to honor the film Crash with the Distinguished Hubert H. Humphrey Civil Rights Award for selfless and devoted service in the cause of equality. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, Dr. Guerra and uh, the several other people who were involved in putting this all together today, Jennifer Magnabosco at the center, David Ayon, uh, who is, uh, who I didn't know as a deep film buff, but he is. <laughs> We've been having a lot of conversations about film recently, and, uh, and I'd like to wel welcome Kathy Schulman here today. It's, it's a real pleasure to meet you and, and to speak with you. Um, you're an Oscar winner. Um, you're the president of Mandalay Pictures. And I've got a screenplay idea I want to pitch. <laughs> uh, you've produced, you've, uh, you're the producer of Crash. You're uh, wrapping up, I guess, production on a documentary about Darfur. Yes. With right. Don Cheadle. Yes. Um, and just leaving your bio, your CV at, at those two points, um, both those projects wear their politics on their sleeve, right? Um, we all know that. Hollywood, by and large, at least has the stereotype of being a liberal place. Um, where do you place yourself within Hollywood's politics? I mean, in some circles in Hollywood, the, the, the term political film would send executives screaming out of a room, right? Are, are you a political filmmaker? What, what do you call yourself? Where do you situate yourself in Hollywood? I have great aspirations to be a political filmmaker, but I think you point out um, a very, very real problem that we're struggling with, which is, um, has been an absolute rejection of that kind of film being financed within the mainstream of Hollywood. And if anything, Crash may have broken down some barriers, and there seems to be a real um, focused desire to make films that have at least a point of view. I don't know if political is, is, is going too far, but a point of view, a, a social point of view, a socio-political point of view, perhaps, starting to open up. We're seeing a lot of equity coming into the business where the equity is, is being utilized in a, in a sort of um, quasi-philanthropic way where the notion is that, that wealthy individuals are investing in films that have a social purpose, a la An Inconvenient Truth. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of an opening. I've, I've had aspirations, to answer your question more directly, I've had aspirations to do this for a long time. It's just taken a long time for anyone to take these efforts seriously. And frankly, Crash was 
a picture that was um, rejected entirely by Hollywood. It was rejected as a screenplay. It was rejected as 20 minutes of cut footage. It was rejected as 40 minutes of cut footage. It was re rejected as a finished film when it, when it had its world premiere in the, at the Toronto Film Festival when every studio in Hollywood passed on it. So it kind of managed to um, emerge out of all of Hollywood's rejection. And, and all I was going to say is, and, I, and I've been able to, at least once so far, utilize um, that breakthrough moment to set up a second film with Warner Independent, which is the one that explores the genocide um, in Sudan and through the, through the eyes of six different activists. It's a documentary or it's a feature? It's a documentary. It's, it's actually documentary. the first uh -huh. documentary that's ever been um, pre-sold to a domestic distributor in the history of American film, believe it or not. Uh -huh. I was going to go back to the, the point you're making about uh, doors, hopefully, or perhaps being opened by, by a film like Crash. Isn't it strange that we're still talking about this, you know, practically 100 years into film uh, history um, after such great political filmmaking like Sidney Lumet with The Pawn Broker? I mean, that was 50 years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's like that door gets opened and then it gets closed and then you have to open it. What is it about that door never staying open to get some momentum going in terms of political rep or social representation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, not being a historical expert, I'm not sure it always shuts or opens for the same reasons. But I can certainly say that of more recent years, this is an issue that has to do with the conglomerization of the, of the film business and the fact that we're tools in a big marketing you know, um, scenario. And so that, that's created all sorts of sort of sterilization and whitewashing and of, of the product. And so we're working against the, the real obstacle of selling to companies, multifaceted, you know, verticals who, you know, are involved in every business from bottled water to orange juice to aspirin. And we're trying to sell a multicultural product or one of political aspirations or social importance. And it's a big, what are you talking about? Let me ask a question that actually precedes the question, the first question that I asked you, which is if you do consider yourself a social commentator, um, then you must believe that, that films have a, are a social force, can have a social effect, right? That it's not just that their films are reflecting society, but that films can actually nudge society. Do you believe that? I do believe it. Um, as a matter of fact, David and I were talking about this in the car, and, and I, I think it's an, it, the way it's done is slightly unusual, but in that I think that the pictures first have to affect people on an individual basis. I mean, the reality is your experience watching a movie is as an individual in a dark room, probably, or you know, even at home. It's, 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 it's sort of a one-on-one -on -one experience in its like first, reading like reading a book, in its, in its first moment. But then it's the discussion of that, the sharing of that, that, that can create momentum. It's, I mean, look, we're sitting here today talking about it with the film up here, so something's happening. So, you know, I do believe it, it can, in fact. And so the, the question that comes to mind then is, if that is true, that films can have that impact, um, my God, the responsibility. Do you feel an ethical responsibility? I mean, it's, yeah. I, I'm in the field of writing. We represent things too, right? We create pictures in people's heads. We create characters, storylines. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, film and, and, and writing, the writing project are connected in terms of representation. Uh, I have rendered characters on a page and I've worried about them, how they're going to be interpreted once they're out there in the world. Once you let go of the film and, and it's out there, do you worry? I mean, did, did you worry about Crash having all the right proportions in terms of the representations of race uh, and class? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, um, I now have those fears post the criticism for that exact, you know, for those reasons than I did going into it. I, I think we approached our story as filmmakers. We were interested in exploring the lives of those characters we created or, or who were based on things that had happened in our lives, and particularly Paul Haggis's life. Um, later, when we realized the actual impact the film was having, we questioned, you know, what our responsibility had been. You know, we were criticized quite often for not being in a, a, a fair representation of the melting pot, pot of Los Angeles. And, and my first defense at the time was, well, who the, said, who the heck said we were trying to do that? You know, we were just making a story. But then I realized, but wow, if this is moving people this way, you know, where was our responsibility? You know, and then you're, you're limited by your own art form as you would be in a novel. There's only so much that fits. 
you know, and there's only so much you can do. You know, the Asian characters have been have been criticized um, in Crash. We've thought about that a lot. You know, I, I mean, there's, <laughs> did we think about it enough going in? Clearly not, but also I could tell you that the actual reality of the filmmaking process was that part of their stories ended up on the cutting room floor because they didn't work, because we didn't get it, you know? So it's, it's a complicated issue, but as I, I sort of move through it now and understand the impact, I think um, you've got to think about what you're doing as you start it and, and, and be more responsible. Right, sure. The, uh, the, the, I wasn't, I just moved back to Los Angeles. So I wasn't in the city when the film came out, but I started hearing arguments about it as far away as, as I was in Houston at the time. Mm -hmm. or, actually, I was in Houston at the time of the, the Academy Awards. And there are arguments in the English department at the University of Houston in the hallway among professors and students about the film right. and whether Brokeback should have won or Crash should have won. I mean, but really intense political conversations right. about this. And I assume that you've been, you know, in front of plenty of panels and, and heard plenty of feedback since the film was released. And uh, so this is not something you, you were expecting. This, this, this is all after. You know what? We were... We couldn't even believe the movie was ever going to be seen by anybody. It was so much of a little underdog that, that the notion that it could have taken on sort of the world's eyeballs this way was definitely not something that, that we anticipated. So, yeah, we, we, we didn't. It's Los Angeles that uh, Crash is, is where it's set. And um, I'm, I'm a native. I, I don't believe you're from I'm from New York. New York. Um, of course, New York gets to represent LA all the time. That's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's why the film got made. No, the, it took um, a New Yorker, come on. But um, uh, as a native Angelino, um, I, I clearly was looking at the film to see if, if the city that I know is there. And, and I assume that a lot of you all, many of you are native, how many of you are native Angelinos? Raise your hands. Oh, that's one of the beautiful things about Loyola. That's a great Very name. And, uh, and we all look for ourselves, right, on the, on the screen. And I saw some of the L.A. that I live in up there, and there was other, other things that I didn't see, and it made me think about the project of representing L.A. in film. And you think about, there's some really great films about Los Angeles, there have been, um, but David Ayon actually was mentioning to me, uh, mentioned to me a factoid that may be relevant or may not be to this conversation, that Crash was the first film set in Los Angeles to, to win a Best Picture. Um, and uh, I mean, LA has been re LA is Predator Two, LA is Lethal Weapon Twelve, or whatever it is. I mean, LA is Chinatown, LA is in all these different films. Um, where do you place Crash in in, its, in 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 terms of the historical representation of Los Angeles? Did you did you feel that you were placing it in alongside LA Confidential or Chinatown, or did you think it? Would you know, we actually the we actually didn't actually feel there was any film that had been representational of Los Angeles, or at least in its contemporary, um, the way that we saw it. It was very much why we wanted to make this film. And one of the things that almost stopped us making this film is that about, uh, before we ultimately were able to piece together the financing, there had been one offer a few months earlier, but it required that we shoot the picture in Canada. And we had to make this incredibly hard decision as filmmakers who can never get anything done and never get any money and everything else that always is happening to us. And, uh, you know, do we give up on the fact that we wanted to make a movie about the Los Angeles we see, the Los Angeles that isn't Rodeo Drive, the Los Angeles that isn't Palm Trees, you know, and we actually turned down the money. And um, at that point, I think we all became very committed to the fact that it, we, 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 we wanted to be the film that was the fabric of... Of a more of a multicultural and a problematic city, that was what we wanted to do. And around the time that uh, I guess it was uh, Academy Awards last year, were in April. They're always in April, right? April, um, March. March last year, February this year. Uh, that was around the time the the marches yeah. were happening. These huge, huge, massive marches occurring. Um, uh, black brown tensions have been uh, were were simmering and then boiling over uh, last year and into this year. Um, uh, the city's got all these problems, the uh, crash was trying to represent them. Were you caught off guard? Tell me if you think that, um, given all that's happened in L.A. since the film came out, uh, uh, do you think that um, uh, Crash, in a way, was, was innocent of how deep the divisions and how complicated uh, the divisions run in so many different directions? Um. That was kind of a loaded question. No, I, I, asking, but, no, yeah. no, no, it's okay. I, I actually think that 
we as a collective were pretty in touch with the fact that we, we made an extreme film that wore its heart on its sleeve, that was melodrama at its best, that was structured as a fable that allowed us to, we really didn't hide or we were not subtle with our points. And we made that decision because we thought the rift was big. And what was surprising was less that people, you know, that, 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 the, that the portrait was, was accurate. What was surprising is how kind of mobilizing it felt to people, that it gave people courage to talk. It gave per people were really coming together over the film, and it was crazy wild, that part of it. We were absolutely naive to the, f the, the social sort of phenomenon that could be created off a movie. I don't even remember mm. the last movie that did that, and frankly, the, the only one, and the one since, and, and surprisingly, you know, a short amount of time between them has been an inconvenient truth. Less, it's not as much of a mass mobilization, but it's, it's, it's had a very unusual life for a documentary film. It's had a hugely unusual life in terms of its youth audience. You know, it's created all sorts of, you know, spin-off ancillary kind of um, forward-thinking, you know, group uh, awareness and action and activism. And it's, and it's like the conversation is occurring on a couple of different levels, right? Because uh, on the one hand, people say, uh, well, no, LA is not as messed up as it is. I remember a, a particular piece in the Los Angeles Times. Oh, I remember that one. Lighting up people on and one exactly side or the other. Right? And it's very, yeah. very kind of like uh, a yeah. very schematic divide. Either, yeah. no, LA is not that messed up and it's a lot better. People get along most of the time. Yeah. Or, no, it's even more messed up. You know, that, that kind of divide there. So there was that <laughs> conversation. Yeah. But there's also the conversation about how the film is doing it. It is melodrama. It is a big, you know, Hollywood vehicle of, of a film, and uh, in terms of how we, how the film was ultimately rendered, um, recently I, I watched a, a big documentary project on, on Los Angeles by a filmmaker named Tom, uh, Tom Anderson mm -hmm. called. Uh, I'm aware of it. How? Called uh, representations of Los Angeles plays itself. Los Angeles plays itself, and he makes a strong argument there for neorealism. Mm -hmm. He celebrates Charles Burnett, you know, the great independent African-American filmmaker from Los Angeles. Uh, he loves Cassavetes, kind of like mm -hmm. quasi-realism, um, and which is a very different approach very different. than uh, the setup for, for Crash. Uh, what do you think of that? Is, is that something that uh, you think uh, might help uh, reveal the city more to itself? I don't know. I mean, I think this is a question of, of getting audiences. I mean, that's something we talk about all the time in, in film. I mean. The, the problem with the most kind of verite forms of, of filmmaking um, is that we haven't figured out how to market that past niche audiences. And so I think that the sort of glossiness of the <laughs> conceit that, you know, of, a, of a film, and by the way, Crash was a low budget film, I mean, by Hollywood standards by far, but it was produced by people who you know, know how to do it right. so it looks like a Hollywood movie. But the reason for that is the sort of slickness of that is is that we know how to market that and we know how to get it to more, you know, eyeballs. And it depends, is your, is your goal to be artistically, you know, um, accurate? Is your goal to be provocative? provocative? You know, you have to look at, you know, what, what it is you're trying to do. I mean, I am of the mind that, that the more people we can reach, the better. I mean, I, I have a very, very tricky road ahead of me with this documentary that I'm doing right now um, because I believe we have an issue in Sudan where we, we, we have such a lack of awareness of this genocide happening in front of our eyes, labeled a genocide during our own lives while it's happening, not stopping it, you know, and, and with very, very little awareness, I mean, we marched around on the Los Angeles streets as part of this, you know, film project and, and found people having zero, having never heard of the place Darfur, the country Sudan, aware that's in Africa or that anything was happening. In huge numbers, I mean, in, in greater than 80% of the case. And so we sort of, you know, I say to myself, okay, that's, that's an obstacle right there. You know, what's going on here? And so we're going to have to get to minds, you know, we're going to have to get to people and we got, we've got to do it. And what I'm going to, what I'm going to label, I feel like I'm going to say this now and I'm going to be reading about it in the New York Times like in two minutes, but like, you know, in a sort of, because I do these things and then suddenly boom, but okay. like, you know, a pop doc kind of a way because pop. I'm calling it pop doc because you know, there's so much discussion in the documentary, you know, this is obviously an audience of people doing all sorts of things, but in the, in the filmmaking world, you know, documentary has been a very precious area where the artistic form is, 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 is tantamount. You know, that's what we, the discourse is in the form. 
And sort of, and, and, and so we're going to be breaking a precedent with this film, and I think An Inconvenient Truth did as well, because it was ultimately a film slideshow. You know, that this is not a high, you know, are we trying to be artistic and move forward the form of documentary, you know, communication, or are we going to try to get as many eyes as we possibly can around the world to see this issue and to do something? It's a movie about activism. It tells you what to do, how to do it. You know, our goal is to get the people to sit there, to see it, to be moved, and we're going to manipulate them in the way that we Hollywood filmmakers know how to do it so that they feel something and they go outside and do something. Wow, that's a weird responsibility, okay. right? All right, but uh, and, but you're absolutely clear about it. This is this is your your. We're doing it as activists, mm -hmm. you know, and we feel that we're going to use the best communication possible that we that we can, given who our given the, what audiences are used to. I admire the way you thought this out and the strategy behind it, the clarity of intention. Mm -hmm. As somebody who works on aesthetic projects too, though, uh, the separate you're creating a separation it seems between aesthetics and politics. And kind of like entering that old age old <laughs> argument about <laughs> or, art or, or we're not, and we're creating an aesthetic for politics. Huh? Well, we're, we're, we have to go see the film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh. And I get a lot of letters that next day. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it, it is very interesting because, for example, just taking one element uh, of the aesthetic that you're talking about, how to manipulate. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the moment in Crash where the, the actual crash happens and the music comes up, you know, big. Operatic. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we slow down time and every trick in the book comes out at that moment to manipulate the audience and we all, most of us, I think, right, felt in that particular moment. But there are moments like that in film where as an audience member, I feel like I'm being clobbered over the head. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm part of the audience <laughs> too, you know, or am I just somebody leap, you know, a feet, uh, aestheticist, you know, I mean. Yeah, well, if we do it right, I mean, hopefully it worked in Crash. I mean, it's such a fine line. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really fine line of, where, of how far you can push it and what is clobbered. I mean, if you felt clobbered, then we didn't reach you. If you didn't feel clobbered, then we did. And we were trying not to clobber, but we were trying to clobber a little. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, right. we were trying to push it to the point that it wasn't ridiculous, you know? We took, you know, that was a hard, that was a really hard scene, you know, especially because we took sound out, which was a big manipulation, right. you know? Right. Um, but part of the reason we took sound out is that we couldn't get the, the impact of the explosion and all of that, given the very little money we had to shoot it, the way we did it, didn't sound that loud and wasn't that great. And we had two choices. We could use effects to turn it into what you think it would be if you actually saw it, which is a manipulation, because we didn't actually get what it was. That, the feeling of the whole thing wasn't what you think, and we had a car that was already turned over, and we didn't really have a crash, and so you're already manipulating, right? Right, sure. So we're saying to ourselves, you know, this is really an artistic, aesthetic you know, argument, but do you, do you take it and, and, and do you make it more extreme by adding all the things that movie magic can do, or do we do the other, which is take out all the sound and put you into a place where you're like in a naked, operatic moment and see what you feel, and that was our choice. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that background on that. Yeah, uh, did we want to take questions also from the audience? Yeah, you know what, just a, one more, two more questions from you. And yeah. then I'll watch the um, uh, Bring Lynn in. Okay. And then, and then we'll have a couple more questions amongst the Excellent. four of us, and then we're going to get the students to ask the tough questions. Sure. Okay, so uh, I guess for, uh, to wrap up this section of the program, um, I'll ask... I'll ask about this. I was away from Los Angeles for a long time, and the, the difference in the city between the city that I left 10 years ago and the city I came back to is the immigrant city. Mm -hmm. The immigrant city that turned out in a million people marching on the street and made history. And that since then, well, you know, that's kind of like that part of the movement's died down, but it, 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 it kind of like broke through a wall of representation that had denied that part of the city or made that part of the city invisible. And I'm just wondering you have tremendous power now. A representation. You had you had it already with Crash. You, as president of Mandalay Pictures, have tremendous uh, powers of representation in film. Do you think about that city, and uh, and uh, and the importance of film in, in representing it uh, somehow? Because it it really does feel like it's it's two LAs. And yeah. you and in Crash, it's it's very peripheral. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like on the edges mm -hmm. of the film. But that's most of LA. Yeah. Why, and why is it so invisible still in Hollywood? You know, it's funny, I, 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 I'm going to answer the question in a sort of personal way because David sent me, you know, before this, this he sent me these two films to watch before, you know, tonight's discussion and there's this one film called The New Los Angeles, I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
and it's a really interesting film, and, and it, it basically starts in the, in the late 60s and takes you through Los Angeles, sort of the formative political and social forces and, 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 you know, up until the present. And I found myself fascinated, glued to the screen watching this, and I said to myself, what is going on? I've lived here since 1988. Why have I never even, like, sought this out before? You know, where am I? I mean, where do I live? What do I, I know everything about New York, where I, you know, where I was brought up. And it, and it really makes you question, like, do you feel you're a transient in your own city? Is, is the city happening around, are you in it? Are you in a metropolis, or is it happening on the fringes? And mm -hmm. I'm completely provoked by the issue, and further provoked by watching this last night, and I absolutely want to devote a good amount of my time and, the, and the, the impact that I can have on the films that I'm able to get made to this issue and to trying to bring the city alive in this you know, living history that we, we call film. And the biggest problem is gonna be where am I gonna find the stories, you know? I, I, and that's the, I'm ready, I'm sitting here, I'm ready. If you have them out there, uh, yeah, I mean, I need, <laughs> the you know, I need, right and I keep searching, I'm going, I go to, you know, agencies, I go to schools, where are the stories? Give me the stories, tell me what you're feeling, tell, you know, give me something to do. It's hard to manipulate that kind of a story. It's hard to pay a writer $750,000 that, you know, lives in, you know, some, you know, mansion hanging off a cliff and, you know, whatever. I always find it weird that all those rich people live on, Houses hanging off of cliffs, but, but you know, and to ask them, and you know, to say and write a story about what it really feels to be in the city we know as LA, like it's hard for us to do from a Hollywood perspective. So we're going to need to, just in terms of where I feel like actively, we've got to do some kind of an outreach to the community to get the voices into the filmmaking circle that show this diversity and that are able to get their own observations of the city into our system. And we have to figure out how to reach out and find those people get them in, and then we'll be able to do something that we're all responsible for and that we absolutely should be addressing. Ruben, that's a good segue to yeah. watch a clip of the new Los Angeles. Oh, to. there you go. Yeah. Why don't we have they paid movie? me for that little yeah. Why advertising. Why don't we have <laughs> okay. watch, and then uh, us three, and then we'll go back up as soon as it uh, is finished airing. We're just going to watch about five, six, seven minutes. So, okay. Uh, so, go ahead. If you want someone to do something socially, economically, politically, you scare them. And then the most visible change tends to be immigrants. In the middle of all this, you had a real estate downturn and a recession. But what we saw was a very anti-immigrant era. And politically, it manifested itself with Proposition 187, Proposition 209, Proposition 227, so much so that the Latino community felt under attack and being scapegoated for the state's problems. Republican Pete Wilson was running for re-election for governor of California and seized upon these fears to his political advantage. His polls were down, and he discovered that he could win votes by advocating a measure called Proposition 187, which would deny public services to undocumented residents in California. And it hit a nerve with California voters. It passed overwhelmingly and re-elected Pete Wilson. What I saw when 187 came about was this concern, this fear by the mainstream that the color and the character of the state and the, and the place was changing. Antonia Hernandez led the first case, which successfully challenged Proposition 187 in the federal courts, where it was declared unconstitutional. It was never enacted. I have a speech. And it's thank you, Governor Pete Wilson. Thank you for scaring the big jiggers out of our community. If you were a legal resident and you didn't become a citizen, then you better become a citizen. And if you were a citizen, you better vote because till we had a political voice that represented our interest and protected our interest, we were going to be a community that would be stepped on. LA is an area where immigrant rights is a major issue for workers, right? And we knew that we had to readjust the labor movement to align ourselves, to uh, align ourselves so that we would be advocates for issues that are important to the Latino community. So we lined ourselves in to be advocates for immigration reform, for legalization, for uh, uh, rights on the job. The history of the labor in this country is about immigrant rights. 
Will there be the Jewish Miguel Contreras becomes head of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor in 1996, and he realizes that he can not only politicize and activate uh, his own members, but that he has a unique opportunity to politically activate this whole immigrant community. And in election after election, he proves that that indeed can be done. We have this vast army of activists, many of them who are immigrant workers. Okay, le tengo una información, por favor. And a lot of them come out and walk precincts with us to make sure get the vote. They don't have to be citizens to help get out the vote. What matters is that they care about this country. This is Harlem. Have you got out the vote yet? Okay. Way back in the early 70s, you could count the number of people who we considered our friends in elected offices on one hand. There wasn't very many of them. And so the idea of getting behind candidates who will be friendly to working families has always been a, a key issue. What policies do we create that is really going to make a change in working families here in the city of L.A.? How is it that we give them hope that they, too, can have a piece of the American dream? We had to make a change in Los Angeles that would connect the struggles, that would be bigger, that would be progressive, that would change the landscape, change the politics, just change the way that workers and working families were treated. Maria Elena Dorazo made a decision with far-reaching implications. Her union, Local 11, would provide seed money for a new organization the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy, known as LANE. It would be a think tank with a practical agenda, changing public policy to benefit low-wage workers. Let's see if I can get uh, Kathy, Lynn, and Ruben back here. Let me start talking about Lynn, who is the producer and director of the New Los Angeles, of which you only saw a couple of minutes. It's a, what is it, one hour? Yeah, one hour. One hour. And it, this was one of four documentaries in the California and the American Dream series, which uh, was produced uh, by Paul uh, Espinosa and Jed, Jed uh, Riff. The series was broadcast nationally on PBS in 2006, and the premiere of New Los Angeles was co hosted by Mayor Villaragosa and all kinds of other dignitaries uh, not too long ago. It has been nominated for an Ima Imagen Award and was featured at the Nosotros American. Latino Film Festival and the San Diego Latino Film Festival. Uh, Lynn Goldfarb is also the producer of Holy Image Hallowed Ground Icon from Sinai. And it's produced for the J. Paul Getty Museum to accompany the Icon from Sinai exhibit. And I think throughout the city you've seen the banners that are it's, uh, advertising it right now today. And you can go to the J. Paul Getty Museum and, and take a look at that. Uh, you know, Lynn has done all kinds of other uh, uh, projects, and her uh, resume is too long to go through. She's uh, also the executive producer for business communication tools for leadership, and she is currently an adjunct professor at USC and a mentor over at Otis, Otis College uh, of Arts. She's also a, a good friend, and she's uh, the uh, sister-in-law of one of my colleagues here in the economics department, uh, who uh, I've known for forever. And also, I ran into Lynn yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, uh, the day before. No, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. Uh, wherever there's some type of uh, mobilization and all these uh, lefties hanging out, I find Lynn there. And it, it was um, it was over at City Hall where they were talking about the living wage ordinance and what's happening with that. And we were just talking about it in my class the week before and all the politics that's going on. We didn't finish the story today because we had to come over here, but there was a settlement that occurred, and you were there to try to um, capture that. So, but to tell me a little bit about what you were doing there yesterday. Tell me a little bit about what prompted you to make this film and how that came about. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, let me start with what prompted me to make the film, because I think then it goes into answering the other question of what, what, where I was yesterday. Uh, I am an Angelino, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I've made films uh, mostly for PBS on 
generally on issues, social issues or historical issues. And I filmed all over the world, and I looked in you know, my own backyard and decided, and my own front yard, and decided that I really needed to, to understand Los Angeles and how Los Angeles has changed. Uh, I am, you know, the series that we did this for, California and American Dream, was a series that was independently produced. And I was also one of the executive producers on the series. And uh, we raised money and we were able to, uh, to, to get a national PBS broadcast for it. It took seven years. You know, it was quite, um, you know, it was a very, uh, uh, difficult series to raise money for, as are most films that have, you know, a point of view and are, you know, politically um, progressive and are trying to make a statement. And what we were trying to do is show a different kind of California. And I decided to look at a different, you know, view of Los Angeles than, you know, we had seen. Uh, I grew up here and I, you know, had gone away to college and had, you know, been out of LA for a while. And when I came back, I, you know, was profoundly affected uh, about the, the transformations that had occurred. And I wanted to understand how and why that happened. And that's one of the reasons that I started, you know, this film as my, home, my own self-exploration, as well as being able to document and tell the important story of the incredible changes that have occurred here that people don't seem to you know, know about. And you know, what I felt was important in doing this was try to connect a lot, to connect the dots, to connect you know, issues around the different social movements or the, the history that people know one part of. But as a filmmaker, you know, I would have the kind of the privilege and you know, the responsibility actually of pulling it all together and trying to you know, tell a you know, more integrated view. Uh, the story that you, you saw in the film about the hotel workers is a key story in the film, and, and one of the key characters is Maria Elena Durasso. And we did film the organs, you know, the hotel workers as they were trying to uh, get a contract, and that's the demonstration that we see in the streets when when contract negotiations were not going very well. The union very cleverly and creatively brought the you know the fight out to the streets, you know, in order to get public opinion and to inform the public of what was going on. Since and, and we also documented the story of the living wage when it was first enacted and the you know the importance of the living wage. Um, since the film has been out or since we finished, I've really been very profoundly interested in still following the story and to really understand, you know, what, I mean, in many ways, we told the story, we told the beginning of, of, of you know, of the, of the change in Los Angeles. But when we end with Villaragosa and the hotel, Villaragosa's election, we're beginning a new story. And so what we're trying to do is follow the story as we're going along. And so, I have. Was that luck, though? When you started filming, you didn't know he was going to win. Is no, awesome? we did. It was total luck. Um, when um, uh, we were, uh, when I first pitched the idea for the film, um, and it got, had gone through you know several different ideas and several different stories, but when actually we came to the, the story that we ended up making. Uh, it, we did not know, have any idea who was going to run for mayor. And originally, we had actually thought about stopping it at the 2001 campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was making, you know, the film, and the, because the film, a lot of it, I mean, a bit of it's historical, but a lot of it was taking place. So we're filming, you know, we're filming scenes that never end up in the film because we're, we don't know what is actually going to happen next, and we don't know, therefore, what the end of the story is. And I remember being. Um, in, in, in the late fall of, uh, I guess it was um, 2004, when we were, um, uh, you know, close to being finished with the new Los Angeles, we didn't have an ending. And every single ending that I tried on it didn't work. And uh, so then we decided, okay, let's really look at what's going to happen with the mayor's race. And at that time, Villaragosa hadn't decided publicly whether he was going to run or not, and we're kind of waiting, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And so we, when he publicly decided to run, 
We, we said, said, okay, this, this could be interesting. Let's, let's follow through the mayor's race till March. And, and then, then it ended, ended up in a runoff, and we said we can't finish the film when we we're, we're supposed to have been done by then. And we said we have to wait until you know the runoff election, which was you know uh, the March election, you know, ended in a runoff, and so we waited until May and filmed and left um, four minutes at the end of the film when we had we, everything else was ready. The other three shows in the series were ready, and we were just waiting for the. Um, How would, what would you have done had he lost? I don't know, we would have had to uh, figure out something else, but we actually, um, we were pretty confident. Everybody, you know, there was just enough of buzz and enough of just the feeling of being here that, and, and understand that, that it looked like he was going to win. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we really had a plan B at that point. We would have had to pause and figure out something else. So I'm going to ask you a very specific question, and I'm also going to ask Kathy. Uh, how much did it cost you? Uh, to, make to make this, this film, film about, about um, uh, well, it's a, it's a little bit hard because it's part of You never of get a straight answer about cost from filmmakers. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be a dollar amount somewhere. Is it like, how much did it cost you? Around 400000 400000 Kathy? 7.5 million. Okay, and that was a low budget film, right? Yeah. Uh, that was a low budget, 7.5 million. What would you do with 7.5 million then? Oh, I could do a tremendous amount. <laughs> I know. We always feel like we end up doing films on the lunch money of, of, of feature films, um, you know, on similar. Meanwhile, we couldn't even afford lunch. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, uh, but you know, even, I mean, so we actually have a, had a really good budget in terms of documentaries, um, but it was very, very hard to raise. And, um, you know, even at the end of the film, we were still you know, in debt, you know, yeah. on it. Uh, um, but even, even during the time that you finished the film, you just, so many things have happened. Uh, we saw Maria Elena Durazo in the film, and she's the one talking and mobilizing Get Out the Vote. Uh, since that time, her husband, who was the head of the unions, has passed away. Another individual was appointed to head the unions for a variety of different reasons. He's not there anymore. And now she is the head of the unions. And, you know, LA Magazine, LA uh, Times, all kinds of different publications put out the top 100 people in Los Angeles. And she has made that list. She's considered one of the probably two or three most powerful Latinas in Los Angeles and one of the, uh, the most powerful union person in Los Angeles. And so it's a dramatic. Or in the nation. Or in the nation. Yeah. In the nation. Well, you know, some of it, I mean, I think there's, you know, this is where there's a lot of similarities between documentary and, and narrative, is that a documentary works on good characters, you know, and we, you know, it is, you know, our responsibility as filmmakers to find the characters that carry the story, to find the characters that we know are bigger and more representational than just who they are. Every character is, you know, is, is carefully um, selected because of a role that they play beyond just who they are and what they say. And, uh, and so we always knew Maria Elena was you know, very significant. Um, oh, another symbolic character that you see there is, uh, many of you noticed, there was a, an elderly African-American a reverend, that's Reverend Lawson, yes. who we had here, I think, a year or two ago come in and lecture, and a very important civil rights leader, making the link between the civil rights movement and what's happening here in Los Angeles. And it's made there symbolically with his presence, him being arrested, et cetera. And, and it's also made very specifically in the film because we have some incredible footage of, of a meeting in 1991 at, at the Hyatt Regency of hotel workers who were um, I mean, the downtown high with the, where hotel workers were organizing, and Cesar Chavez and then James Law, Reverend Lawson are there together. And we felt that one of the things that we tried to do in the film and we, it was to bring the connection and where the civil rights and the immigrant rights movement came together in Los Angeles. And I think Los Angeles is a place where it definitely um, uh, not, not just immigrant, immigrant rights, rights, but Latino, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Chicano, Chicano rights movement, movement came together. Uh, and, and, and Los Angeles, Angeles is very significant in the, in the way, way that the leadership, leadership you know, has, 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 has come, come out of coalitions that have been built and that are, you know, that are very strong between civil rights, you know, and immigrant rights and farm worker rights. And, and those movements are really... Because, uh, another importantly symbolic piece that you see here is the police. 
and you see them in riot gear, you see the shotgun. What, this was 2004, right? That you saw that. And before that, there was the Justice for Janitors, where you actually, we have film of that, where the police are again in riot gears and the police and, and on horseback, and they beat up the Jan uh, Justice for Janitors. Just last fall, and many of the students here participated, there was a march on Century Boulevard where the police showed up in shorts, bicycles, no helmets, no belly clubs, no guns, and they just showed up and it was a completely different police department and it was just not even a year and a half. And they showed up and they had prearranged everybody who was gonna be arrested. And it was all, uh, it was staged. Uh, how many of you went, went to that march? I think there was like, uh, uh, we many of them participated in that. I, I let the students go in front of me. And, uh, this, uh, and, and then we filmed that. Oh, we did film yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We've, We've been filming. Do you see the difference between yeah. the reaction of the police department? There's an incredible difference. And actually, and that's one of the wonderful things and one of the critically important things actually about filming Los Angeles is that you, you actually see you know, the difference, because we see, you know, from 1992 in the civil unrest, you know, you know, and the police there who were incredibly, totally irresponsible and, you know, the, um, uh, uh, you know, a large part of the problem, you know, you know, that had occurred. And, um, you know, then to, you know, 2004, well, well, then, then to the, the Justice for Janitors, you said in 2004, where, but, but you know, know even, even at in Century, Century Boulevard, they had their own um, handcuffs and, and stuff yeah, like that. Just, but uh, we've been they filming. They were wearing shorts and riding yeah. bicycles. How threatening is that? <laughs> we've been, and it's interesting because as we were putting together this small film that we did on September 28th, you know, you're looking, okay, well, how do the police fit into this? You know, are they, you know, how do you portray them? Also on September 28th, one of the important things is, is Reverend Lawson, you know, also did civil disobedience training, you know, and so again, bringing that connection, you know, between civil rights and immigrant rights. Um, we've been, and kind of answering back to the question about living wage, I mean, we have been following uh, the hotel workers uh, over the last year and filming, you know, the different, um, uh, activities and the is different issues both around living wage and Century Corridor and, um, you know, and hotel worker organizing. And we were at that, you know, press conference because we've been documenting the story, you know, because we think it's an incredible, um, uh, you know, story of, you know, dealing with issues of, of, of working poor and what it means and what to live in Los Angeles and what, um, uh, what are the, the, the responses of um, workers, you know, because, I mean, it's absolutely, I don't know if any of you were at the FAST as well, because I know there's some LMU students that were there at the, the FAST that um, happened on Century Boulevard, but, uh, you know, here are workers, you know, pitching tents outside of the Weston Hotel, and they're not organized. I mean, these workers are trying to get organized, so they actually have no protection of the union. They have actually no legal rights that would present, prevent them from being fired. But they felt so strongly to, you know, in the cause to preserve the living wage that, that had just been voted in and that the hotels were trying to um, get a referendum to get rid of that they chose to have um, a fast and so there were they were out there for seven days and there was a group of students um, that did this sit-in this what they call a fast in actually at, at the Hilton Hotel where they marched where they um, protested you know in, in solidarity with the um, the workers and I think the student movement has been very instrumental in this yeah. Kathy can I ask you a question so you're president of Mandalay what does that mean I don't know, I've only been there for 16 days. Because <laughs> I kind of think of uh, the movie industry kind of like in the banking industry. Have you ever seen, everybody's a vice president. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, so, well, when, I mean, they must have given you a job description. No, I know, I was kidding. Um, yeah, no, Mandalay is a, is a tw almost 20 year old uh, movie production company that's uh, owned by Peter Gruber and Paul Schaefer. And uh, the, the company's involved in all sorts of different entertainment ventures. and and has made movies from Rain Man to Batman. And um, I, you know, the, the, it's, it's an issue of sort of rebranding the company, which had sort of lost its um, focus over the last number of years. And so I was sort of brought in to 
um, revitalize the brand, both in theatrical motion pictures for the studios and also we're, we started a division called Mandalay Independent to make more progressive films. So how'd you get the job? You go to monster.com or how did that happen? <laughs> I was looking for a job. I was actually, it's a funny story actually, I was on Peter's show, you know, Shootout. I don't know if any of you have seen that show. And um, it's on Sunday mornings, and... Sunday you know, morning, forget it. None of the students no, are seeing no, no, that. No, 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 watch that show. It's a talk show on Sunday. They're doing, they're doing homework on Sunday morning, right after yeah, they go right. to Mass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had... No, it, it, whatever. whatever. It's, 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 I was on a show, and I, I, I was involved in this sort of notorious lawsuit over the last number of years. Oh, notorious. Why was it notorious? Oh, God, I don't know. I mean, I've been involved in two notorious... Well, because it, it, the, 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 the person who financed Crash ended up suing myself and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Producers Guild over not being handed a gold statue. Because we're in kindergarten. But anyway, and so... Um, I, don't know. You can, you, I, know there, I know a pawn shop in Hollywood where you can get him one. I look at it, I offered mine. It didn't work. Um, but anyway... So, I was on Peter's show, and we were talking about this issue, and I was really heated and annoyed, and this big thing had happened with the papers, whatever, and he said, well, you know, Kathy, I mean, everybody knows that producers produce for the golden statue, not for money. And I was like, easy for you to say, Mr. Batman. And, and I went into this whole rage on television, and I guess he found it really charming or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, no, he said, I need a fighter. So, anyway, that's why. So, so when, when they, they gave you this job, job they, they told you to do exactly what? Uh, no, I'm, well, you know, I have a mandate to, to make a certain amount of pictures per year in both of these areas of the company. So you actually, actually get to choose? Yes, I choose the pictures, and I have to arrange for the finance of the pictures and put the pictures together. And, you know, before this, um, I've had various jobs in the movie business, but I was an independent producer the last six years or seven years, and, um, you know, where you have a phone and a car and a pad and it's all, you do it all at the same time while you're getting gas and you just, you know, you sort of scramble to get your movies made, but this is more of a, a slightly more executive job and I took it at a time that I feel that, that based on what I have sort of earned in terms of my reputation in the business that I can use this, this, this position hopefully to get some really interesting films made. It really is a sort of calculated move for me to try to help some other um, filmmakers, emerging fil filmmakers, interesting voices get through a system that intends to reject so that's, that's really, that's, that's my, my personal, personal goal, whether it'll work, I don't, you know, we'll see. But um, that's the job. You know, when I first saw the film, I hated it. Crash? Yeah. I, that's a normal reaction. Like, I hated actually, it because you hated the experience of watching it. Yeah, and I actually wanted to walk out. Yeah. Uh, I was so, Some people it, did. it was, to me, it was like, that is not my L.A. And I couldn't see any part of my L.A. in that. And mm -hmm. uh, the only thing is that I loved Sandra Bullock. I have never <laughs> been a Sandra. No, I've never been a Sandra Bullock. You liked her when she was a bitch. You're just like Gary yeah, Cooper. It was. Just, <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. My wife may end up watching this scene. So I don't know. Uh, Ruben, Ruben, help, help me. To yeah. say, <laughs> say, say something. something. Segwaying here. Yeah, uh, they, they have some psychological yeah, profiling. <laughs> That. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, what's interesting to me is sitting uh, between a documentary filmmaker and a feature narrative filmmaker, and how the documentary form has leapt up from a little, it was, you know, on the operating table dying uh, a few years ago, just a few years ago, the, the, the documentary form. It's come back, and it's not just uh, in film, the documentary is back in literature, the non-fiction non books, on way more than fiction books, and so there's, there's this moment where uh, 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 nonfiction and fiction are competing with each other, kind of like front, front and center in terms of both film and, and pop culture in general. And it seems to me that, you, not understand what you were saying about the manipulative yeah. aesthetics of a film and melodrama, uh, it seems that film has to be authentic, it has to be real. You have to have the grit of you know, some realism there for it to have uh, any sort of authority. And the documentary, of course, thrives on that same authority. And I'm just wondering if you guys have any interest to discuss that a little bit, you know, this particular moment uh, of a film. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it, it is this great, you know, moment. But I think that, you know, what makes it, not a but, but what, what makes a documentary really work well are many of the same elements and what, you know, makes a narrative film work well. And so, you know, we have an opportunity here, you know, in terms of, you know, an appreciation and an understanding of documentary 
we have the ability to make films at a much lower cost because of the technology um, uh, really making it much more available and accessible to people. But you need, you know, the good storytelling skills and the good characters to make a documentary work. And so I think that um, they are coming together in a certain way. And I think the, you know, the principles that that um, define both are, are, are the, you know, have a lot of similarities. Yeah, I, I, I would just, just add to that, that I think, think there's a reason why it's happening now. Yeah, I, think I think there's a couple of reasons. reasons. I, think I think, first of all, we're a world in crisis, and I think there's an absolute desire for people to understand the stories of the people standing next to them or across the road or across the ocean. And we're made closer by the Internet and easy access to lots of information um, internationally. And I think that those forces in combination with um, the growth of reality television, believe it or not, which is, has allowed people to embrace storytelling that's messier, that doesn't require um, you know, easy endings, that has multiple storylines, you know, truncated storylines, has sort of has, has, has opened up the audience to you know, um, formats that are, are less, uh, you know, kind of have less agenda as a, as a format. Like I think actually the hardest movie to sell in Hollywood today you know, if, 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 like, like, if you, you were all my, my I, I teach at UCLA, 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 and if you were my students, I'd say, like, don't, don't go out there with a romantic comedy, comedy where the boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy runs, you know, know next to a train and gets girl again at the end. end. Like, like, nobody, nobody wants, wants that. that. That's, That's not, not the world in which we live. live. That, that I actually think there's a rejection of a certain kind of fiction going on in both, in both, in literature and in film because of, there's a rejection of a certain kind of, 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 of whimsy, maybe because we know so much about what's actually happening. Happening, happening but, but that's, that's a sort of a different subject. But it's, it's a time for a reason, you know, it's happening now. So the, the romantic comedy is dead? Really? No, I didn't shoot that. Right now with, uh, what's your name? Well, we don't see those verses yet. Um, no, I, no, I'm just saying, no, it's not dead. I'm just saying that that, 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 that is not where the industry is moving. You know, yeah, that's, that's not, not where we're going. going. It's, it's not what's happening on television. It's not where we're, we're headed. We're, we're, we're really getting, getting messier. You know, you know David, David and I were talking in the car that I was interviewed a couple days ago uh, yeah, um, for the LA Times and story about, um, you know, yeah, what, what, what are these, these this year's screenplay, screenplay, the best screenplay, screenplay nominations. There's, There's 10, 10 of them, them, you know, 10 original stories and 10 based on other, you know, adaptations. And... And, and so, so this journalist was kind of funny. The situation had been calling people all day because he had the job of making a story about what's the similarity and all these things that were nominated. And he was really struggling. And he got to me at the end of the day. It was like close to five o'clock. He had to book the story. And he's like, just, I, just, just, just tell me why you think they're similar. And I said, they're not. That's the whole point. There's the celebration. There is nothing about them. It's this is an amazing year. It's multiple story. It's multiple storylines from multiple, you know, um, countries with all sorts of ethnicities represented and every kind of genre. And this is an opening. Like this is about more storytelling. There isn't a through line. That's the celebration. And and I think that's what we're seeing. We're going. We're moving. We're moving in the right direction. Slowly with struggle, but we're moving. So, Ruben, why do you think that the well, the question you asked, answer it from your perspective. I actually asked this very question to uh, one of my classes recently about why it seems everybody has to be real. I mean, you know how in hip hop, the whole idea of having to be authentic mm -hmm. is like the, the hardest currency you can possibly have. And uh, so, you know, why is everybody trying to be more real than everybody else? And reality-based TV, and you can just look everywhere, and you see people trying to be real, or trying to rep represent the real. And Which is one, kind of a profound notion, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and one, one student, student just cut through my, you know, rather abstract uh, questioning, questioning and said, it's because, because they're being told lies all the time. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we've had uh, a, a pretty, pretty intense, intense uh, political moment, moment in this country. country. And, and a, a lot, lot of big lies have been exposed. And there's, and there's a lot of lies that haven't been exposed yet. yet. Um, and, and so I think that's how a film like An Inconvenient Truth can actually all of a sudden, you know, uh, get a lot of traction because people know that something is wrong. You know, this is very, he made such a good point, you know, that this filmmaker made such a good point in Inconvenient Truth in that one part of the film, you've probably all seen it, where, you know, he, he says, well, here's 900, whatever, I forget, it was like 968 or whatever that number, crazy number was, um, you know, scientists and there, we asked them the question, is global warming real? And then, and then the same amount of journalists, and it was like, you know, 
all the scientists said it was real and 90% of the journalists said it wasn't. Like, like that, that, that points out the need to answer the question. Like, come on, science is real. Yeah, but right? we, we've been lied to before collectively. Yeah. 1970s Watergate. I think the combination of you're talking about and the and internet. And tell each other right. being lied to. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I always tell my students, don't believe anything you read on the internet. So that's another issue. No research on Wikipedia. Internet, like internet group think is an interesting phenomenon. So, Kathy, are there any scenes that you cut that you wish had stayed in? Oh, there's, there's one, one thing, thing that I love, but, you know, um, that, 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 that had to do, do you, you know, know that, do you remember uh, the, the woman who works in Sandy Bullock's house, and there's, there's a very emotional scene towards the end of the movie when she says, my, when Sandy says, you're my only friend, her name is, the character's name is Maria. Um, a very original name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, anyway, Jennifer S. Zito's character has written, who's also not Latina, that'll be the next one. Um, yeah, Jennifer S. Zito's uh, uh, character is her daughter in the screenplay that was written. And the reveal of all that, 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 that there's a connectivity between those two characters, um, was something I always liked that we couldn't fit in. And we also have a relationship, you know, but you can't put it all in there. I think one of my favorite things about the film, I ended up liking it the third time I saw it, kind of liked it. <clears throat> but that all, I mean, that all these characters are somehow interwoven, but in many other films, they, they have to come and meet and, and, and confirm that. Here, you don't do that. Right. And, and I love that about the film, that, you know, that whether it's the, the, the fact that, you know, the uh, detective's uh, uh, brother gets killed by another cop, but yet they never meet or talk about it. In many other films, you just have them, they always have to meet somehow to, you know, uh, uh, bring the story to an end. And you, you didn't do that. Or did you ever feel that you had to have them meet or uh, confirm? No, I think that was, I think Paul said it in that little clip. The director said in the, in the little clip there that, you know, he wanted to make an ensemble movie about people who don't know each other. Um, that ultimately, I think part of that's cut out, where he goes on to say there's a collective impression and in individual stories that don't meet, mm -hmm. which was sort of his point. And um, I think that was very much the agenda of the film in the television show coming to you soon on FX. Um, they meet each other finally, <laughs> that cop and I, other cop. Well, so there's a sequel. No, not a sequel, just a television yeah. show. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you don't like sequels? I know, I do like sequels, but it's kind of hard. It's like, like there's, there's dead, dead guy, guy and everything. And everything. You know? <laughs> Where'd you go with that? So, well, let me see if any of the students have uh, questions. But uh, Ruben, before we ask the students, so as to prepare the questions for extra credit. Uh, anyway, uh, if you uh, if you had another question or comment, I uh, guess you know, I'm really interested in how we move forward from this point on uh, in terms of the city as a never-ending project. I really loved what you were saying. I mean, there's the, uh, once you stop filming, the city goes on. Once a, a documentary or a, 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 a documentary filmmaker stops, the, 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 it, it, it never ends. And um, uh, I think there's a moment occurring in the city that, that needs documentation in, in all forms of uh, pop culture, all the genres. But I do think that there's something about verite and documentary filmmaking that I don't think the strongest point of Crash was the melodrama. I actually thought the strongest points in Crash were the moments that really rang true, like, uh, I'm sorry, I forget, I'm forgetting her name, the, the Latina cop. Oh, the the Jennifer Esposito? Yes, thank you. Saying, I'm Salvadoran Puerto Rican. Yeah. I'm Salvadoran Mexican. I'd never heard so, a character in a film say they were Salvadoran slash something else. Yeah. That just had never occurred in a mainstream Hollywood. So do yeah. you park your car on the lawn? <laughs> no. no. Well, I just don't want to know what combinations do and what combinations don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but By the way, the, the hardest part of Don hated doing that. We had such a job. I don't know, he did it so well. I don't know. He hated about that. saying that thing, man. No. He was like, I am a producer of this movie. This is not good. Um, <laughs> you know. But it was those moments that, you know, with details that, uh, that uh, Paul Haggis found in his own research, stuff that really cut through, that was what was powerful to me. And so, uh, I wish Cassavetes was alive to, like, roam around L.A., but there, I know there's a lot of young Cassavetes out there. 
and, uh, and whether they're filmmakers, uh, documentary filmmakers, or narrative filmmakers. And, um, and I can't wait to see those representations. So, Kathy, what's the Paul Haggis story? Tell the students in terms of that. There was some personal experience? With oh, yeah. He was, the, the, the true story is he was mugged by two kids along the lines of the ages of our kids, you know, Ludacris and Lorenz Tate, um, in Westwood, exactly in the location we shot, well, across the street from the location that we shot. And, um, and he absolutely, they, they took the car, it was an SUV, and, you know, they and went home and changed the locks in that house, which is his house that we filmed in. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and the idea for the movie came that night when he was having a fight with his wife like that about this notion so of changing. So it's autobiography. Well, just this part. This is well. it. About changing, about just about changing the locks. And she apparently was saying all sorts of obscene things, not so much about the locksmith, but about the two guys that had, you know, she was mad. They'd stolen her car and put a gun in her face and everything. And um, was saying all these things, and he started to think about these two characters. And So like, she's mad at him. They're having a family fight, and he's thinking about work. This yeah. is great. <laughs> he's, 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 he's thinking, I can make a movie out of this. That's yeah. right. Uh. And, um, and apparently, he really did say, like, that line in there, like, did you check on James? Which, you know, like, like, like in the middle of her, like, crazy, passionate thing about why the city's not safe, he was, like, trying to get out of the conversation. Anyway, he thought about, the story goes, or as he's, you know, told it. Anyway, so he, he really thought about, who were those kids? They looked so young to him. That was what touched him. And one of the kids, he thought was really good looking. And he, and charming, like, had a real sparkle about him, you know? And he started to think about, like, what, who are you? And why are you doing this in Westwood, you know, in the middle, like, in, in, late, while the movies are letting out? And he traced, and he made up the rest, everything else. Right. But, but it was like, and I mean, there's things that obviously are kind of excavated from his life story, but right, right. life experiences, but yeah. And then he sort of went, well, where would you have gone? And who were these kids? And what were they doing? And then he just started to go from there, and that was how he invented it. Questions? Cornelius. Oh, wait, yeah, Cornelius, yeah, microphone or something? you're going to ask such a profound question that I want you to come over here to the microphone. Really? Or maybe better <laughs> or yet, we can get... Or just talk really loud. Or, or just talk really loud. Yeah. What measures of impact um, in narratives and documentaries can be long-lasting since Christ came out with his career? What do you so mean by profound, what measures? I don't measures? even understand the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So in other words, what will people be thinking about Crash in 10 years? Or do you mean what can Crash do to make Hollywood change? Both. Both. I hope that, you know, look at, I mean, Crash, you know, we're really honored that it's been invited into, you know, national curriculum. And hopefully it'll be taught in schools, not in film classes, but in, you know, history <clears throat> classes. And maybe people will see it as sort of one of our kind of cultural relics. And we, we hope it'll, it'll become a classic that way. I, I can't now. I mean, it'll be whether or not people continue to embrace what the point of view was. What it's done in terms of, you know, Hollywood, I sort of addressed at the beginning that I think that a little bit opened the doors a crack, try to make more things like it. I mean, I'm constantly hearing, like, agents call me, and, like, they're so used to saying, hey, you know, we got, we got writers who are going to come in, and they're going to pitch a story a lot like Crash. And I feel like saying, you can't say that to me. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> they're, like, peddling the idea. So maybe, maybe the point being, like, people might be able to do more. So if I'm teaching American Studies and I use this film, and I would say at the end, the three lessons of Crash are? Well, th you'd say, first of all, I hated it. No. <laughs> I would say that. Okay. Let's assume I had you as a guest lecturer, though, and you would say. And you would be nice. The three, yeah. I'm, I'm nice. <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. But really, I'm really, I am nice. you felt that way. No, I mean mm -hmm. it. I really love that you honestly said that way. It said that too. I really mean it. Anyway, so what, what are the three lessons of Crash? Um, well, I mean, I mean, this is a, well, this, I'm going to put this on the midterm of the students. What okay. are the three lessons of crash? So they're going to write down what you're going to say right now and it'll <laughs> be on the midterm. <laughs> well, let me answer it by saying that we were trying to make a movie about fear. That so it really the, sounds too long. It's okay. like one, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> oh my God. Um, don't take out the fears that you have in your interpersonal relationships, the problems happening in your life. It's, it's, it's easy to take it on and people who take it out on people who are different. It's easy to use your, to use, um, bigotry as sort of a safe haven for anger and don't. Okay. Is that one or two? One. Oh, go on. Okay. That was one. Um, <laughs> well, who says there's three? Um, it's okay. Four. No, I don't even know if there's three. 
Um, oh my God. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I, it's well, hard. I'm going to ask the students what are three lessons, and the producer what doesn't do even me? know. Can't even answer that. <laughs> One out of three. That's a D. What do you think? The, can we ask them? What do you think the lessons of Crash are? Um, I would be really curious to hear. Daniel. Who had one? Oh, were you asleep? I'm sorry, Daniel. <laughs> Somebody yawned or made a noise or something. Well, what, what's the lesson from? I didn't get anything out of it, actually. You didn't get out of anything. So there were no lessons. See? Another one. Oh. Okay, the game was being played a different way, Daniel, but oh, okay. Okay, you know what? He didn't have the answer. No, he didn't have. See, my name. Um, yeah. Nobody else? Kevin? It was a Sunday but... You have a question, too, okay? You're going to get... Who, 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 who's right there, right there. Go ahead. Okay, Ray, Ray. I think it's a good point. I think that one of the things that was the last, what, what we were trying to explore was that there's good and bad. It's, it's very easy to separate people into like the people who are the white hat, the people who are the black hat, the good people, the bad people. The, you know, and, and it isn't like that. And Matt Dillon's character was intended to be an exploration of that. Like, there's a reason why he was feeling the way he was, but he's taking it out the wrong way. You know, right. He was frustrated about yeah. what's happening to his father in the health system. Okay. I also love that character is that duty overcame beliefs. And typically we have beliefs and action. And you're a racist, you know, or, or, and then you act on that. But here he, he took the role of being a cop and had to act on that right away. And right. That, that overcame that. Charles? Well, I thought it was interesting that a lot of people focus on overturning the negative stereotypes associated. But I thought one of the more interesting parts was the uh, overturning the positive stereotypes and the danger of the positive stereotypes associated with Asian Americans as being the model minority. And you know the dangers of both negative and positive stereotyping. Yeah, I'm sure most Asian organizations didn't like that, though. Mm -mm. So, uh, yes, go ahead. I think that's something very important that film is that we should all recognize that we are, we're all prejudiced. Because Ryan Gosling, he was like the good cop, the one that was open-minded. But when he's writing with those African American men who have the same, thought it was that he immediately just reacted and shot him and killed him. So I think that sometimes we think we're all virtuous, and even inside we still have. Yeah, you know, I also love that scene because, again, it was the cop. The, in that scene, I don't think that a, even a white racist guy would not have shot him because he wouldn't have made the assumptions that the cop made, wouldn't have the gun as ready as the cop. Mm -hmm. So, again, it was his role as a cop that made him do something bad, whereas the Matt Dillon ca character, the role as a cop made him do something good in terms of going in there and Yeah, and, that, and that's say, really picked that up. We, we tried to do uh, that, yeah. So, Daniel, you had a question? Yeah, um, I'm scared. <laughs> He's in the class, he's, you know, he knows I hated it, so he's got to hate it, too. What audience or what target um, group are you looking for? Because I feel like a lot of the movie was based on racial tensions rather than class, which is probably the real problem with Los Angeles, as shown by uh, Lynn Bopard, over in her documentary. And I was just wondering, you know, you, it's kind of a low-budget film, but you have a lot of big-budget movie stars who are kind of capitalizing themselves and the characters that they supposedly portray. So what is it? Who is this movie made for? Because it's really not made for me. So is it for like the West LA person that's scared? Like, what's it for? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you actually may fall into the biggest demographic that came to see the movie and be because the 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 big by by the market research that's been done, eighteen to twenty six year old Latino and African American um, males were the top audience for Crash. So I don't know wh where you fall on that, but, but, um. Well, they misunderstood. They thought it was car chases and crashing. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what happened. It could have been because Ludacris was in the movie, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but so, so I don't know. It wasn't made for a Democrat. It was actually made, intended to be uh, what we call for, you know, like we were tending to make it for everybody. We really didn't, didn't 
set out to make it for a particular demographic. But I'm interested in what you say about um, that, that, it, that in, I think it annoyed you that you, you call these big budget, you know, movie stars. I mean, they worked, each of them, for Schedule F, which is $65,000 over the course of the entire shoot of the movie, and for and everything they did afterwards, every piece of publicity, everything they've done in the, in the two and a half years of their lives that was crash. And that's not a lot of money, you know, for Wait, for Sandra like Bullock that. only got paid sixty-five $65,000. $65, all of them, every single person, and that's a fact. It's true, Schedule F. So I think that if, if your anger was, yeah, well, you're trying to tell, you know, real stories, but you're using big movie stars, fair point of view, but these particular big movie stars um, did this one for love. But there, there was, can I? Yeah, well, 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 yeah. Yeah. Class. Sorry, Nicole. Yeah, we have class. That's an important yeah. thing. I forgot. Yeah. I forgot class. You want to do it? Yeah, yeah, I just want to, I think it's very, very difficult to do films that deal with class. And, uh, you know, whether it's documentaries or whether it's, you know, um, narrative films. And even the film that I made, I could never have received the money to make it if I said I wanted to make a film about labor, uh, you know, labor unions. Because they really... Yeah, so the they, lesson is lie if you want to get money? Yeah. Well, that's right. Not exactly. But, um, uh, no, but it's very interesting. I mean, there still is a real prejudice against, you know, films, you know, uh, that deal with issues of, of you know, uh, uh, deal with issues that are central around working class issues, and even immigrant issues are still very difficult to do. Um, the reason why we got it funding is not because I lied, but because I mean, I was, we were I able. Be serious. No, no, no. But no, but it, we we because it was part of a series about California. And as part of the series, you know, in, on, about California, I was doing a show about the transformation of Los Angeles. And there it was fine because I was looking at the issues of, of race, class, and immigration, you know, in terms of, um, I mean, race, race, class, labor, and immigration in terms of shaping LA. But if I said I want to do a film that looks at the hotel workers or looked at, you know, the, you know, how labor, you know, became, um, uh, uh, you know, important in Los Angeles or how it helps transform the political landscape, I could not have raised the money to do that. And so uh, it, you know, it's still, because we are selling these, we're looking for financing from people who have money, people who have financial interests that feel threatened by you know, the power of workers, you know, I think, you know, that exists. The first film I ever made was called With Babies and Banners. Mm -hmm. And it was about women in the sit-down strikes in the 1930s and the strikes that helped bring about the organization of the automobile workers. And we were, you know, and helped actually bring about the, the, the organization of the automobile workers at the time when they became a really strong power you know, on political life, and it was very, very hard to ever get, you know, to get the money on that, and and uh, we really struggled because no foundation would want to do that. You know, first of all, it's about workers, and then at that time in particular, it was about women workers. I mean, women, you know, in the labor movement and women, you know, the role of women, and so you know, I think we still face a lot of those um, those difficulties. Yeah, let's get Nicole and then um, Dr. Fitzgerald. I don't think it's Hollywood's sole responsibility to educate. I think that's not fair to put, you know, that in the hands of people who aren't educators and aren't caregivers and aren't, you know, trained to do that kind of a thing. I think it's one of the things we can we can put into the mix. But I think that primarily we still, I mean, Hollywood's primary agenda is to, you know, make movies that entertain. What what the magic is is when you can say something important or teach a little lesson or share a little wisdom while you're entertaining. But and making money. Yeah, and making money, which is interesting. Don't, don't forget wanna, the president's stuff. I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, Mandalay Independent, because yeah. you, you said earlier that uh, the 
the uh, the agenda there was a progressive one, yeah. specifically, and, and what is that going to look like? In uh, film? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to just, I mean, I, I, I'm interested in, um, you know, contemporary independent film that deals with urgent issues and that is, and, you know, sort of self-distinguishing issues and, like, I mean, you could use an independent to d division to do esoteric movies about, you know, the French Revolution or whatever you want to do. I mean, I'm focusing what we're doing on sort of the cosmopolitan <clears throat> youth now. And it's, it's all narrative. Is there any doctor? Oh, no, we'll do both. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dr. Fitzgerald. Yeah. I want to just add to my colleague and friend, Fernando Guerra. I'm in love with Sandra Bullock, too. I didn't say I was in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when it's a female movie star, all the focus is on physical beauty. But I saw her on a talk show, on the Letterman show. She's highly intelligent. She's got a great sense of humor. And she has a strong social conscience. And Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'd be able to email her. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get a question over here and then run over there. Go, go ahead. I'm just curious, I see that the focus of Crash has become race, and I'm curious if there are any other aspects of the diversity of LA that you are interested in presenting, or do you think that there's any aspects that you left out? Like you mentioned with class, are there any other aspects of the diversity that you wish that you had or did? Specifically, class. I, I want to try to figure out how to make that movie. I went to this really, you know, in a similar kind of setting to this situation tonight. My child, my, my, my kid's school did an event last year where they invited, you know, the grade schools, and they invited a panel of, of people, including the police commissioner and various people. I was on this panel, and to speak to the parents of a, a big cross section of, of Los Angeles schools. And they saw Crash, and then we were having a conversation about it. And what was so amazing is that everybody was focused that night on, cra on, on class, not on race. And the stories that were coming across, like, that, that touched me the most were these, there were women in the audience who were working as, you know, caregivers in various families, because a lot of these schools were private schools. So it was a cross section, but there were a lot of private school parents there. And, and also the caregivers. And they said that, you know, they walk into the school and that people literally step on their feet. You know, and that they, you know, and, and brush them their shoulders aside and, and don't pick something up when they drop it. And somebody even had their car bumper hit because she was driving like a sort of banged up car versus a big, you know, Mercedes. And, and um, it made me think that's what we have to do. I just trying to, like you said, I'm trying to find the story that, you know, that, that does it without saying that's what you're doing and that does it in a way that's humane and interesting enough that people are going to be entertained by it. But, yes, that's one, for sure. Uh, how many people saw Bread and Roses? Raise your hand. I didn't see that. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because that film is dealing, dealing uh, the class is foregrounded, much like yeah. it is in, in, in Lynn's film. Or your film actually integrates everything pretty, yeah, pretty well, race, class, and, uh, mm -hmm. race and class, but, but Bread and Roses is also a, small, a much smaller budget probably than... Uh, and it wasn't made in the U.S., and you never could have made it here. Mm -hmm. You know, you could not have... I mean, that's an incredible story. Uh, was it wasn't made in the U.S.? <coughs> no, it was made in Britain. Bread and Roses? Yeah. Set in L.A.? The yes. Justice for Janitors? Yeah. Yes. It was made... It was really... Yeah. I didn't know It that. wasn't made oh, here. Oh <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah. It, it, you, can, you can look from a distance at it, and it becomes an interesting subject. I mean, it's a, an, I mean, it's a great, great story. You know, it's... Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't... And a narrative uh, film. Yeah, it's a narrative film, yeah. Film, but it, it, it's, yeah. it's hard to... Yeah, you know, you know, I like the question about diversity, not only class and, and, and race, but also place. You shoot a lot of different parts of L.A., but not the beach. Yeah. And so to, in a sense, have a diversity of space in, about space in L.A. and not have the beach is, like, incredible. So that you can we almost avoid We didn't have a lot of things. I mean, yeah. No, which know. I think is a good thing, yeah. but uh, anyway. We were actually trying to specifically show the L.A. that isn't beaches and mm. um trees. So go ahead. You had a question? Um, I'm really interested in what motivates people because I think that's a big part of achieving social progress is getting to that other way to do something. And not necessarily being their best interest. Earlier we were talking about how um, we're shifting more towards true stories and non-fiction stories and, and cultures are consuming more of that than horror or uh, romantic comedy now. Um, what, if anything, can we say that 
this kind of shift in interest says about society and our motives and where we're going? Is it going to be easier to achieve things or more difficult to achieve things? And how does how, yeah, where does Hollywood fit into this? I think Ruben, I, I think Ruben ought to answer that since mm -hmm. he's got a chair. Uh, name, you know, he's got a name chair that he holds as professor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how that gives me the authority to answer that specific question. Yeah, it requires but, a conclusion of sorts. Uh, hmm. Well, I, okay, I, Kathy, you can go for it. No, no, I, I'm a little stumped because I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm feeling a little bit of a shift, and that we're, we're that people are. Uh, I'm feeling. Maybe it's just where I'm at right now, but I'm feeling uh, I'm an increased activism, but it might just be the slanted universe I'm living in. So you could probably answer Well, that. Lynn, you hang out with, I mean, yeah. Yeah. hang out with activists. Yes, I, I, think, I think part of what's really important to do, you know, and, and hopefully the changes that are happening, is that we need to look at our own stories. And we need to, you know, document the, those stories. Uh, I mean, I, I'm so... Um, disturbed actually about the lack of, of of documentation of video of film about the real Los Angeles I mean I took you know a small story I mean I took a, a specific period of time and I had the most difficult time finding actually documentary footage finding footage that was more than just you know news stories finding footage that went beyond stereotypes Finding footage that um, you know got you know into the essence of something that allowed us to understand why or how something's occurring, and you know since I finished in New Los Angeles, I've been very committed to to to, to really trying to find a way of preserving and documenting you know, our history and making sure it's done because if we don't do it, we will lose it. If we if we in Los Angeles don't look at who we are and where we came from and the stories that are around our lives, then we'll de be defined by the news media in the future. And we don't, I don't certainly want to, 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 to just be defined by how others see us or by sound bites or by, you know, uh, uh, you know, what's, you know, what's considered propaganda. Really. Pro propaganda or by, you know, strictly Hollywood or other images that are made about us. And I think the stories that will, you know, come out in any kind of, you know, genre of film, you know, are the stories where we, you know, look in our own neighborhoods and our own families and, and to really start seeing kind of the incredible stories that emerge out of that. And so that's what I hope will be a trend. Yeah, go ahead. I'll get you Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, um, one, I was wondering about your personal journey, not so much like the professional journey of where this film took you, but more of your personal journey. Like, I'm sure you read the script and you were like, wow, this is an incredible script, but you didn't have foresight to really understand how this would change your perception of the city, of your place in the city, your place as a woman, a white woman in the city and how that affected you. And my second question is... She must be a psychology uh, major, but go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. And my second question is um, on the note of what you were talking about with more people kind of recording your personal stories. And I'm wondering if with um, your new job as the head of, um, of whatever... Mandalay. Mandalay. Um, and the new popularity of like documentaries such as The Inconvenient Truth, Jesus Camp and the Fly the Penguins, if um, you guys think that this is going to be something more common, more, um, more, more money is going to be being put into more popular documentary film in order to kind of get, just gain more interest and more, more money is going to go towards that direction now that it's becoming more mainstream. Hopefully. Well, go ahead, Kathy, on that first part, and then we'll ask you how easy it is to raise money. But yeah. um, about your personal journey. If we had a couch, we had we let you, we let you lay down. But right. Do now. you mean my personal journey that, that of making it, or what's happened afterwards? I just mean, I, I mean, not making it, but what's happened afterwards. Like I'm sure you didn't expect to be sitting on forums 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, it's crazy. interesting. I, I actually, it's funny, and I had a, I'm very close friends with Lawrence Bender, who just made an inconvenient truth, and we just had this conversation over the weekend that who would have thought that, you know, both of us as movie producers, suddenly we made these films, and frankly, our life, our sort of simmering lives as, as, as activists, surged forward to the point that like he lost a whole year of movie making by traveling around the world talking about an inconvenient truth and I lost close to as much time if you call it a loss and what we both discovered and is that it became so much more exciting like I'm so much happier now to to understand the power of the medium I wish I could also figure out how to be, make a living being an activist but but you know so I don't know that one one can take the place of the other but um, I guess that just from a personal sense which is what you're asking it's been an extremely rewarding th thing to watch the impact of something that may have been a private simmering thought amongst a few become something that can impact a lot of people so you know hence why I'm doing it again with this Sudan situation which has been harrowing by the way as from a person it's a personal journey thing because we ran into so much trouble with the State Department, with the Treasury Department. We have been through, I've, like, my, my process of making the Darfur movie, forget about, like, how hard it is to make a movie. Like, try getting through, like, the U.S. government. I mean, it has been, like, I knew nothing of this. I knew nothing of what it means to try to make a movie in a country that where we're in an embargo and trying to, like, shoot a picture in the Sudan while we can't trade with the country. And, and a million different things and how many people tried to stop us and, and, and how extraordinary high-powered ways. I mean, really amazing things. So, so but there's no censorship in the United States. No, no, there's no, no, no. <laughs> oh, it was cra crazy. I mean, every p p power that could be tried to stop this film from being made. It may not even be good. You know, who even knows, like, if we're even going to have any impact. But, it, but they didn't want us out there, you know, and, and it was interesting. So, well, Lynn, it's a, it's a lot easier now to raise money, right? It's yeah. rolling in. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, before I answer that, um, will that be, end up being part of the story when you, uh, when you release That's the film? You know, uh, we're trying. The difficulty in, in it's, the it's, censorship and all of that. It's funny you say that because that's like we're sort of traumatized by this whole issue right now. We don't have enough money. Like this is so horrible. Like we should be filming everything that's happening here. You know, we've got crews out and various. You know, we're it's multi. You know, it's very. You know, we're on a number of different continents. We're dealing with people all over the world, but we don't seem to ever be able to get any money out of our studio to film our own process because I think well, it's not Mandalay. No, this is well. No, this was this was before. Yeah, it'll, it'll come under me. I was going to say, you're, you're president. What? I mean, yeah. No, 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 no. We're not financing it. Warner Brothers is. And, um, and um, Warner's, I think that, I guess they're not that interested in having us spend money to show how hard they've made it to make our movie. <laughs> you know, so we're in a funny thing, but it is, it's really, really a crucial part of it. But we have kept a living, we have kept a diary. Mm -hmm. So we can use voiceover and we can use some, and we have some of it on film. Yeah, that's probably the, the that's way probably the, the better least film. expensive part the film as well as the Except we never have the filmmakers here. They're always, you know, no, but, yeah, but yeah. It's hard. hard. It's very, very, very hard to, you know, to raise money to make documentaries in particular. I think, you know, when, you know, those documentaries that are breakthrough documentaries, those documentaries that we see in, uh, you know, the theaters, some of them have had, you know, decent funding. Some of them have, you know, been people, you know, have sacrificed everything. They've, you know, they've, they've been passionate and, and, you know, involved in it, and they've decided that, you know, they'll work other jobs and do this or borrow money, you know, you know, whatever to, 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 to do that. Foundations, um, which are just normally kind of a place where you think you could get money, are very difficult. There's a lot with the, I think with the increase of documentaries, you know, there's also an increase, you know, the number of documentaries out there needing funding, needing distribution has also gotten much, um, uh, you know, bigger. So the competition is actually much greater <coughs> as well. So it's still, nope. sorry. <laughs> no, uh, uh, anyway, this, uh, uh, so where did the 400,000 come from? Who gave you the, who funded it? Uh, we received our funding uh, from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, from PBS, Ford Foundation. Uh, Here's a list right here. Yeah, yeah. ITVS, um, <laughs> uh, the um, California Council for the Humanities, uh, and then they have these consortiums, which they call the minority consortiums, which are public money. Uh, so there's Latino, there's Native American, um, uh, Asian American. 
and you know, Skirball Foundation. Uh, so there, a lot of public money, interestingly enough, a lot of public money that we were, um, that was committed to us earlier, you know, before, every, before Republicans came in and, and, you know, kind of took over all of the, you know, the, uh, kind of the, on the national scale, like the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, we would have never been able to get this funded um, when we actually started. We had, I mean, interestingly enough, the way that we, well, first of all, there was four, of a, four producers doing the series, and we were all really strong, you know, producers, had lots of credits, and had been doing it for a long time. And we came together as independents to, you know, to, to do the series. When we first, when we got our first money, it was from the Corporation of Public Broadcast. I'm sorry. It could be a funder. Or else, uh, I, I thought I put this on the side, right? Um, anyway, when we first got, um, <laughs> funny, okay, just turn this off, okay. Um, anyway, when we first got our money, it was from a consortium called the Minority, I mean, it was called the, um, uh, what was it? It was a diversity fund in the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. And so we received money in that to begin with. And then that fund went away, fund went away. but we still had our contract. And so it was, but they would, they had given us money, but we would not let us take any of the money until we had raised 80% of the budget. And that took us another two years, actually, to, to, to get enough so they could actually release the money to us. And um, uh, it was, you know, so it's, it's always a struggle. And, you know, there was an opening at this, and the diversity um, money was, uh, you know, both in the, the fact that, the, the, that our teams and the whole series was very diverse. It was, it was diverse ethnically. It was diverse um, location-wise. You know, it was diverse kind of in the subject that we were, you know, making. Yeah, so and it was really tough to get up. the money, yeah. and, and is, it, is it easier now? No, it's, it's really, um, I don't think, I think in some, some subject matter it's probably easier, you know, because, you know, they get, you have trends, you know, somebody like Jesus Camp or something you said. I mean, all, you know, there's a lot of interest in, you know, you know, evangelical issues or there's a lot, you know, kind of this going behind the scenes on certain shows. And, you know, I think if you're in kind of this, you know, this, this trend of subject matter, it may be easier. But I think documentaries are always difficult. Right, we have time for uh, three more questions, and we're going to have them all ask the question, and then you're going to answer combining all three questions. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, no? That's Kevin. right. Uh, this question is for Lynn. Mm -hmm. uh, in your experience of filming the new LA, uh, how do you think the American dream sort of fits into the immigrants' rights movement? And also, do you think that it functions to help or hinder <coughs> the class mobility? Okay, hold that thought, Lynn. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you, this is also for Lynn, you mentioned the connection between the immigrant rights, farm worker rights, and civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee the mobilization of any other people, any other groups of people in LA? And are you following any of those groups? Or do you see a need for <coughs> some other sort of mobilization? Okay. Mobile. Stephen. Uh, 
Okay, Lance. Well, actually, I, it's more of a statement, but I'd like to uh, give the responses. I, um, I, saw, I thought it was an incredibly candid piece on commercial television. It was either a week or two weeks ago. It was on 2020. And they had a follow-up on Nightline. It was a, uh, a documentary by Diane Sawyer. She went into a camp in New Jersey uh, tenement. Did anyone see that? The one where the woman's stuck, it, the one that the woman that's locked in the kitchen? Or the bathroom? They really looked at it. I don't know. The problems that the urban poor face. Yeah, I think. Particularly the youth, in terms of trying to get a good, solid education, and having to uh, travel long distance to uh, find work, you know, the mismatch but it's not a documentary, it's a news magazine segment. I was really surprised that commercial television had something so candid about social class differences in that I haven't seen anything comparable in years. I wonder if you saw it, and why would commercial television go out on a limb and portray that, but you suggest it's so hard in film to get funded, that sort of thing. Hey, Kevin? My question's for Lynn. At the march back in September, like one of the things I noticed when I was watching all the people who get arrested was like the number of different uh, clerics of different faiths, like Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, they were all there. I was wondering what role you saw uh, faith or religious institutions playing in helping the people who are fighting for justice within Los Angeles. Okay. Now you got one minute to answer, <laughs> and you have to combine all, you have to give an answer that addresses everything that was asked for you in three sentences or less. <laughs> three sentences or less? Okay. Uh, I, I think that the, the issue of mobilization is very important, and the work on mobilizing uh, in, in terms of, of uh, immigrant rights and workers' rights in Los Angeles has been very successfully done by the, a coalition of groups, including labor, uh, clergy, community organizations, and students. And I think for the first time, you know, we're really seeing, you know, these groups really working together uh, in terms of, you know, a common goal. With any in, in any organize in any demonstration or any organizing or any even press conference that's ever done by these labor and community groups, they're very conscious to make sure that it's all ethnically mixed. You know that there's always representatives African American, Asian, Latino, you know, and, and white. And and with clergy in, in particular, the, there's a lot of organizing going on among clergy of different faiths to really make sure that they're out there and that they're very visibly out front, you know, in terms of that organizing. And lastly, on the American Dream, I think that the immigrant rights movement is really, you know, uh, people striving for the American Dream and to realize it, you know, to try to realize it in their own lives and whether they are, you know, Documented or undocumented workers, it doesn't really matter. They are striving for the American, you know, for you know what they believe the American dream to be, and that's a better life for themselves and for their children. Wow, that was good. She synthesized all that. That's a new partner game we can play. So it's like, <laughs> your turn, Kathy. Wow. <laughs> I think yours is easier. The 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 stock. You know, how do you respond to the stockholders in this protest industry? I mean, Lynn kind of alluded to it that in a protest you have to do it right. You have to get so many ethnic groups and the whole thing. Is there an industry? Is there a way of doing this? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about, you know, there's a couple. You're talking about marketing, philanthropy, and marketing activism, and also celebrity activism. And and the reality is, um, it's really tricky. You know, we're we're finding out that that celebrities there's a real value that people tune in where celebrities are where the cameras are um and and there's a value to celebrities therefore putting themselves in front of an issue and us taking advantage of it if that's one way to make people stop look and listen it also has to be very balanced because it can turn into a kind of a ridiculous you know sideshow as well and and we're trying to figure out how to do that which is intended to answer your question of you know when you get to a point that it starts to look like marketing, it's going to be ridiculous. On the other hand, it is actually helping you know the issues um, get out there. And and to illustrate this, I hope this is sentence number two. To illustrate this, I, I think it's really interesting. One thing that happened in our documentary with Darfur is that 
one of the issues that we're dealing with are, are the trade partners in Sudan, um, particularly Egypt and China, vis-a-vis -vis the oil um, trade. And there have been, the, when, when there was a slight opening a few weeks ago where um, Egypt was willing to discuss the issue with an American delegation, which did happen a few weeks ago, they called George Clooney. They didn't call George Bush, and we filmed that. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Um, and, and what world are well, we? Because George understood the issue better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just. I didn't say which George. <laughs> <laughs> and we, I find that fascinating. So you're, you, you point out such a good issue. Like, what do we do with this? And, and George, by the way, Clooney was like, what, what, what do I do with this? Like, I, you know, like, and, and, you know, so this is, this is a complicated area. Um, and um, regarding your observation about, you know, the, the, this sort of more ag aggressive reality-based story on television, it, it, I tried to say earlier, and I believe there is a movement in the direction, and that's just what you're perceiving, and it's happening in little bits and spurts. I want to thank our guest, especially Ruben Martinez, who is going to be a father of twins Tonight. any day now. And so, yeah, but thank you all for coming. <laughs>